there again. Now, for some time, there's been a whisper, well, actually not so much a whisper, more like a roar, that diabetes can be reversed through dramatic weight loss. Not everyone agrees, and it's a contentious area amongst diabetologists. So to bring together some various opinions on this, we have Professor Roy Taylor from the U uh, University of Newcastle and Professor Michael Nauck from the Ruhr. Uh, hello to both of you. Hello. Hello. So, Roy, this is your particular bag, and uh, it, in the UK, we're very familiar with uh, Roy Taylor because he's been saying, it's very much been in the headlines all this week, that if you can't fit into the trousers that you were wearing when you were 21, then you are potentially at risk of diabetes. So, Roy, you're very clear on this. Just tell us more. Yes. Just to clarify that message that's been carried by newspaper headlines, newspapers tend to pick up things perhaps in an in improper context. For people who have type 2 diabetes, but they've got a normal or near normal BMI, they can get rid of it. But let me wind back to the start of this story, because this is 2006 when we finally got all our information on hepatic insulin sensitivity and uh, what happened to liver fat. And suddenly, all the pieces of the jigsaw dropped into place. I was able to draw up the twin cycle hypothesis of the cause of type 2 diabetes, which we published in Diabetology in 2008. And of course, it's no good having a hypothesis. You've got to go out and try and destroy it. And so we set up an acid test for this. We took a group of people with very ordinary type 2 diabetes and put them on a low-calorie diet specifically designed to be practical and acceptable. It turned out that it was, and the average weight loss was exactly what I had wished for, which is 15 kilograms. And lo and behold, all the predictions of the twin cycle hypothesis came true. Liver fat fell to normal from very high levels. The fat export from the liver fell, and it stopped silting up in the ectopic sites, one of which is inside the pancreas. Now, we've known for a long time that in vitro, if you expose insulin-producing cells, beta cells, to uh, excess fat chronically, then they will begin to lose their ability to secrete insulin. So the counterpoint study set things on the map. But in order to test the hypothesis, we'd only studied people in the first four years of type 2 diabetes. And to condense the next decade of research rapidly, we've been able to show that it's duration dependent. After 10 years following diagnosis, the chance of getting full remission is relatively small. We've been able to confirm the mechanisms repeatedly including the most contentious part of the mechanism involving the pancreas. And uh, we're now in the position of being able to say, yes, this approach to weight loss is so simple, it can be rolled out in primary care for everybody, not by doctors, but by the nurses. It's so simple. The snag is keeping the weight off long term. Now, we can lose weight rapidly. People tell us it's much easier than the long-term bit. But even so, in our direct study, at two years, 36% were still free of diabetes. And even in that short study, there was a major signal that cardiovascular disease was less. Certainly, new cancers were dramatically reduced and put together that was a significant reduction in overall risk to health. So at two years, yes, that's big news. So why don't I stop there having just outlined where we've come from, which is testing ideas and then probing them with cutting edge methods uh, to look inside the body to see what happens. Michael, would you like to respond to that? Because it, it, is it about the amount of weight loss or the percentage of weight loss? And can it be sustained? 
Well, the sustainability issue is is the difficult part, as Roy has just uh, mentioned, uh, because many people succeed in in reducing their body weight acutely, let's say for for three months or so. Uh, but of course, we don't want the benefits of weight loss just for a short period of time. So we aim at uh, diabetes remission. Uh, for as much time as we can achieve. Maybe I should add that there is another way of inducing such major weight loss, and that is bariatric surgery. Uh, so gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, different procedures. And they really uh, can achieve major weight loss, minus 20% plus, uh, which usually persists for a very long time, and usually in those who undergo this surgery with pre-existing type 2 diabetes often experience diabetes remission. So remission is possible, but as Roy says, that uh, you know this is weight loss that can be uh, uh, patients can be assisted with their weight loss by a nurse rather than a doctor or a surgical procedure is obviously a big advantage. But I think you take your message further, wouldn't you, Roy, that actually you really need to be getting hold of people at a time of life when they might be tipping into type 2 diabetes, and that's the time to get them. That's the time when you can make most difference. Yes, that's absolutely right. Although uh, we need to be quite realistic here. In order to... Uh, take action and go down the dietary road to uh, substantial weight loss, about 15 kilograms for most people, then people have to be motivated to do it. Now, the diagnosis of pre-diabetes, that's a very useful form of words because that conveys to people, yes, that this disease that they know might pose a risk to eyesight, might pose a risk to limb, Premature death, it's a bad sounding number. People will respond at that level. Now, the work that I've presented at EASD this week is very pertinent here because it deals with people who look as though they're slim. Well, we can tell them they're not slim because they've got abnormal amounts of fat inside the liver. Interestingly, if you compare it with the population norm, it doesn't look too bad. But if you compare it appropriately with people in the same range of BMI, then it's about two and a half times raised. And we see with weight loss in this group, now this group only need 10 kilograms weight loss. First of all, they get back to the waist size that they had when they were 21. That's where the strap line comes from. And secondly, the diabetes goes away. And goes away, well, in, three quarter, in uh, two thirds of the group that we've studied so far. We have identified some people with monogenic diabetes, one person with slow onset type one. We've got to be very careful with diagnosis in this group. So yes, for younger people, and bear in mind that the decade in which the greatest weight gain occurs throughout life is in the twenties. This is a potent message. So we could, put into a little little packet, if you like. If you've got a, a family history of diabetes, make sure that you don't put on weight beyond the age of 21. That would be a very sound message that I hope Michael would agree with. I take entirely the point about other means of weight loss. We've got exciting drugs on the horizon that might help us. But bear in mind, my work was directed towards understanding the mechanisms, finding out what caused diabetes. I believe we've done that, uh, but it's a matter of the application that we're now talking about. And I think the application to young people is especially engaging. Michael, uh, I have to tell you that in, in the UK, when we saw all those headlines, everybody I met said, is anyone fitting into their trousers that they had when they were 21? So there was a, there was a bit of kind of, uh, oh, no, we're all doomed uh, going on. <laughs> so I, 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 I happen to know that Roy is in the trousers, that, not in the same trousers, obviously, but is in the trousers that he, waist size that he had when he was 21. But there's an awful lot of us that are, that are not. 
Michael, how do you feel about that? Well, this is certainly not applicable to my uh, body weight history. Uh, and uh, the, the, the problem associated with this, so I think uh, Roy is exactly right that the, the decade between uh, 20 and 30 years is when you start putting on uh, weight. But who at this age would go to see a physician because he has put on three kilograms of, of weight. I think uh, we have to raise the awareness and uh, we, we have to design programs that uh, make it possible that at that stage you can do something uh, because you certainly need an intense program. And uh, if Roy says uh, physicians are probably not good for that, uh, it should be a nurse-based program, that is because you need repeated encounters. Uh, you will have to deal with disappointments and uh, changes in body weight in the wrong direction and all these things. So this uh, is, is, uh, requires a lot of effort. Can could I establish I, I one comment? Oh, sorry, come back, Roy. Uh, could I could I comment there? Because uh, that's really very important. Michael makes a really important point that people in their twenties have got things to do. They don't want to be sitting in doctors' waiting rooms. No, no, no. But this is not a message we want to have medicalised programmes putting over. We need to get it into the woodwork so that Granny tells the young people. You make sure you don't put on weight beyond when you finish growing, my lad. Now, it's a matter of an apple a day keeps a doctor away. It's getting the idea out into society. Now, at the present time, society is blithely unaware that it is not biologically necessary to put on weight beyond the early 20s. There's no extra bone that's growing. There's no extra brain that's growing, unfortunately. Any extra weight gain sadly, is fat or fatty tissue more strictly. So we need to raise awareness gently in such a way that doesn't either drive people to uh, uh, foolish dieting and also doesn't cause undue uh, worry. But we have to try and normalise the matter of just keeping an eye on the weight to make sure that you don't increase in clothes size. Do you think we've established that, uh, I mean, clearly we see it in, with bariatric surgery. Do you think we've established that type 2 diabetes in its early stages is reversible? Because it seems to be something that is still pretty hotly contested by quite a number of um, people in uh, primary care. I don't know whether, uh, whether that feeling is right throughout uh, diabetes. Michael, what's your thought on that? Well, we need dedicated programs. If, if we just do things like we used to do them, it will not happen. Uh, so the direct study is a very good example of a dedicated team that uh, really was very successful in making uh, these type 2 diabetic patients lose weight and maintaining that weight loss for at least a period of one or two years. Uh, and uh, this gave us the idea to talk about diabetes remission because suddenly uh, this happened and we didn't have a name for it. Uh, but uh, if you have diabetes and suddenly you have a normal HbA1c and you have lost substantial body weight, uh, how are you going to call it? And this gives the idea and it's an idea for the future so that hopefully more people will benefit from programs like this one uh, with the aim of, of putting an end to their diabetes. Well, Roy, you've certainly put it on the front pages and people are much more aware of it. We've been talking all throughout uh, these uh, sessions on ESD TV about the importance of raising awareness of diabetes and absolutely uh, this message that lose a lot of weight and you you can push it into remission if it's early. And the message to the, about your trouser size, that really has hit home. So thank you to you both for coming to talk to uh, us about this today. It's very much appreciated. Pleasure. Thank you. And My pleasure. There's more to come. Bye for now. <laughs>